Hello, Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to Critical Eye, a, a new program in which we're still focusing on the controversial issues that affect us as British citizens, as citizens of the globe, but looking at things from the lens of faith and morality. These are two fundamental pillars that we have uh, have rooted within this program, which hopefully sh uh, shed a light on mainstream issues from a slightly different perspective going in behind the headlines and trying to find the real truths. Which, with me today to share some of this uh, uh, the discussion that we're going to engage in is Father Frank Gelly. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Sayyid Mohammed Razavi is actually here. He'll be joining us just shortly as well. Our topic today is fascinating, though. We've got British elections coming on, and yet we also have the American elections. Both are looming large. Boris Johnson, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Donald Trump, and the rest vying for your vote. Which way will you vote? What will you vote for? Are you going to vote with your conscience? Would you think about morality as a as a method or means or a vehicle for your, your vote? Or do you just look at economic expediency and what you've always done? Uh, you know, obviously, from a, a faith point of view, morality is really important and moral politics is really important. So what the policies of these gentlemen or these parties are, are awfully important. We're going to unravel some of those policies very shortly. But first, uh, we have a short video which uh, outlines some of Jer Jeremy Corbyn's vision, just one of the candidates out there uh, trying to persuade us to vote for him. Jeremy Corbyn is the leader of the British Labour Party, the country's official opposition party, making him and Conservative Party leader Boris Johnson the two most likely candidates to lead Britain as Prime Minister after the December 12 polls. Advocating for human rights, socialist and anti-war policies from the Labour Party's backbenches, entering politics over 40 years ago, Corbyn earned himself a name and respect amongst many in the country's left wing. The lifelong anti-racism and anti-war campaigner shocked the entire country when in 2015 he was elected as leader of the Labour Party, which was unexpected as he reportedly only ran for the position after none of his left-wing Labour Party allies would. I lead a party that is huge, there's half a million members. I lead a party that's very determined to tackle inequality, poverty and injustice in this country. This election is about the future direction of this country. We've had nine years of austerity, we've had nine years of increasing rough sleeping homelessness, nine years of more and more children growing up in poverty and going to school hungry. A Labour government will not tolerate any of that. We want to create a society where there aren't people living in poverty and hunger. And that does mean changes, and we'll make those changes. In the coming general election, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party will run on the promise of bringing the country a second Brexit referendum, entering into a three-month negotiation period prior to this, in order to organize a deal with the European Union in the event that the country votes leave again. Corbyn also promises to save the country's national health service from U.S. privatization and warns his Tory party rivals plan just this. The threat to our NHS isn't a mistake. It's not happening by accident. The threat is there because Boris Johnson's Conservatives want to hijack Brexit, to sell out the NHS and to sell out working people by stripping away their rights. As Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn vows to negotiate a Green New Deal to tackle climate change. He also promises to end austerity, which has plagued Britain for nine years. Well, that was a, an interesting journey through uh, Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto and agenda, well, at least some of it. Certainly, th uh, the issues of NHS and saving the NHS, those are popular issues and things that really concern people. But, of course, Brexit is the other biggest uh, issue of all that seems to be uh, on the agenda. Uh, but are any of the parties really morally uh, absolutely squeaky clean from a divine perspective? Let me throw the, that divine uh, politics into the mix very early on. Christianity, Judaism, Islam certainly all have very similar uh, ideas and thoughts around what moral politics might be. But in practice, often Muslims, Christians and Jews don't necessarily operate that way. Again, we seem to leave our moral 
politics or the divine moral politics aside when it comes to self-interest, greed, and our own personal, uh, if you like, uh, desires. Is that even uh, a right thing? In Britain and in America, of course, it's said that religion is on the wane. However, if you look at the political scene, Christian Zionists, um, Jewish Zionists, even Muslims, uh, are all, if you like, vying for power. Hindu uh, or Hindutva lobbies here in Britain, as well as, of course, the same suspects that I mentioned earlier, are all also out on the campaign. And they're using often religion and morality and their own, uh, if you like, vested interest to persuade their communities to vote one way or the other. The Muslims largely push for Jeremy Corbyn in fear of the immigration uh, issues that uh, the, the, the right wing are fermenting and the anti-Muslim uh, sentiment in general. Uh, you'll get, for instance, the chief rabbi of the Jewish community here in Britain uh, virtually telling everybody to vote conservative because he doesn't like Labour's anti-Semitic uh, attitudes. We dealt with that last week, very dubious claim there, but nonetheless it's out there and it's what will may persuade uh, Jews in Britain to vote a particular way. He's influencing them. The Hindutva uh, lobby have been sending around uh, posters <coughs> against what's been called the Muslim Vote. Uh, a certain group within the Muslim community has launched Operation Muslim Vote, and that is really trying to get people to vote, but to vote also uh, for the issues which they think will uh, help the Muslim community. Is this focus on uh, our own religions uh, good for society, or, uh, or a secular <coughs> democratic society, or is it bad? Do we even have a democratic society? There's an argument also to say that we have a pseudo-democracy, which is in fact a plutocracy. So the rich boys really rule and pull the strings. They just mug us into thinking we've got a democracy. We vote once every four years, and then they take over again. Uh, am I right? Am I wrong? We'll start the discussion with uh, Father Frank, I think, on this. Frank, I, I want to bring back uh, this issue of uh, morality and come to the Christian uh, vote in the Christian community. Tell me a little bit about Britain in particular, because America is slightly different. But in Britain, is the Christian vote important? Well, it, it was important in the past. There was, for example, a non-conformist vote. Um, Lloyd George was prime minister during the First World War. He was a Welsh uh, non-conformist, evangelical leader. And there was a constituency for the kind of vote. I'm afraid that has dissipated. Um, they, they used to say the Tory party, the Conservative party in this country, sorry, the Church of England, the National Church, the Anglican Church to which I'm a member, was the Tory party of prayer. So close was the link between the Anglican Church and the establishment, the middle class and the upper classes. Later, Sometime later, in the 80s, he became, Church of England became the Social Democratic Party of Prayer. So it was actually moving towards a kind of wishy-washy uh, liberal democracy. Today, the Church of England is nobody at prayer because the influence of the church is marginal, because of a secularization, because of the pusillanimity the pusillanimity, the cowardice of many church leaders who do not really have the courage to speak out, the influence of the church is minimal. Now, I want to point out that the connection between politics and Christianity in this country is actually institutional, because we have 26 bishops, Anglican bishops, who by law sit in the House of Lords so as Lord spiritual, and the monarch is actually the supreme governor of the, Ang of the Anglican Church. And uh, there are parishes scattered up and over the country which are there because of, of, of the institutional connection. And you know, the church has always had a voice in some moral issues, very strongly. I mean, for example, during the Second World War, when Churchill, not one of my heroes, uh, enacted the policy of obliteration bombing on, over German cities, targeting civilians, which contradicted both the laws of man and the laws of God, the Bishop of Chichester uh, at the time spoke out in the House of Lords and said, this is wrong, this con contradicts uh, the teachings of the gospel as well as ethics and morality in general. Mm -hmm. 
So, and there was another, someone else, William Temple, great artificial Canterbury, who had a strong social agenda. And there was a moral agenda as well. But today, where are we today? The Church of England has no, does not really speak out about matters like abortion. Last year, 200, uh, to over 200,000, 205,000 abortions. Now, um, the Labour Party, I support Jeremy Corbyn, but the Labour Party, I'm sorry to say, its programme is to have basically abortion demand right up to the time of birth. So he almost shades off into infanticide. So the church should speak out on these matters. There is a connection between ethics and the Christian faith. But if we don't speak out, how can you blame? Yes, it is secular society. We all keep sort of uh, moaning about it. it is. But if a church does not speak, nobody will pay attention. So it, we, we can't. It's our fault as well if we are silent about these matters of literal life and death. And also the matters of, uh, you know, uh, the church uh, now they want to teach primary school children about uh, lesbian and gay relations. And, uh, I mean, that is, seems to me uh, very worrying. Their parents were demonstrating outside uh, schools because they do not agree with that. It should be up to the parents to have uh, some the kind of oversight of children until to a certain age, not to have small children. Primary school telling them about these matters, it mm -hmm. seems to me, uh, they're very dangerous of a family to uh, cohesion to everything. Well, this is a, a really good opening salvo from Father Frank. I mean, you've opened up several areas. Of course, Morana, Muslims generally have voted Labour because they, obviously, being immigrants, being traditionally part of the working class here when they arrived, and also knowing that Labour has, has got uh, better policies, by and large, for uh, social issues. Islam is quite a social religion in many ways and it's very political as well in many ways uh, but of course Muslims arriving in the British secular environment have had to adapt some of those views and also have to bite the bullet on some major issues but is there really a palatable choice for a Muslim on the one hand you have the Tories who have quite bigoted quite racist quite Islamophobic policies very very openly I don't think there's any question about that on their track record by and large uh, and then you have Labour which for a while maybe went exactly as the Tories did because Tony Blair wasn't and his his kind of Labour wasn't that different from the Tories from, from what I could see but now Jeremy Corbyn has come back I mean, he does seem to have brought back some of those old socialist values, which will appeal to Muslims, for sure. But at the same time, as Father Frank Gelly is saying, uh, he also supports the things like gender fluidity and, you know, this uh, the, the pushing the LGBT agenda, agenda very, very um, vociferously. And as, as well as that, you've got other issues which uh, labour around abortion, which uh, uh, Father Frank has raised as well. These are all things that, that you, would, you would find troublesome as well. Do you think it's a case of voting for the lesser evil? Is that the way in the end the vote is for a religious person? Yeah, I mean, as a Muslim living in a non-Muslim environment, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult for Muslims to decide. And as you mentioned, that uh, the best choice is to choose the lesser evil uh, because the policies... I wouldn't even say Islamic. The, the, the policies of the majority of the parties in the Western world are not religious. They contradict Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They are, they are not uh, pro-divine uh, religions. So basically, internationally, the trend is going against religion, although uh, the trend is going against religion. Religion is still the fastest growing, uh, I mean, like Phenomena, Islam. yes. Yeah, Islam, mm. Christianity, Judaism, they're all either they are stable or growing. So well, this, this shows that uh, they are trying their best, but uh, religions are not uh, uh, stopping their growth. And th this puts a greater responsibility on us followers of divine faith 
to get together and uh, do something. Well, I've used the word divine politics, you've used the word divine faith, and uh, this is an important word, which is anathema to the secularists who you know, <coughs> turn in their graves every time we talk about God and politics or God's involvement in our lives. It's pretty hard for a Muslim, who's, uh, and a Christian Jew for that matter, to avoid this reality. I can't help but wonder that Say Hazrat Isa, Jesus Christ, when he came down uh, in Palestine, way back in that period, he was up against the political authorities of his time. He had a political manifesto. He overturned tables where money lenders, etc., were, were, were trading their wares. He attacked the Pharisees and the doctors and the Sadducees of the time who were conforming with Roman law and Roman imperialism, if you like. He fought demons. Yeah, godliness. We'll come on to that, Father. Right? And so I'm, I'm interested in his politics, uh, the pro politics of Christ, if you like, and of course the politics of Muhammad peace be upon him, neither of which was, was terribly different. They were with the oppressed, they were with the poor, and they fought against uh, imperialism and, and the ideologies. There's a bit of a cover-up, I think, amongst some of the Christian fraternity where the, uh, Christ isn't portrayed quite in that sort of politically evangelical light or revolutionary light. But there's no such uh, uh, possibility with the Prophet Muhammad and Muslims, although some Muslims take it too far and others uh, are, are, uh, basically want to wipe out and make Islam also apolitical. But in the British election <laughs> scenario, at the end of the day, what is divine politics to you within the British environment? What, do, what would divine politics perhaps look like in this environment if we were able to change things from what they are? Well, I mean, divine politics would not disagree with the moral values, ethical values. And uh, moral and ethical values uh, are not against any divine religion. So as, as long as you are taking care of the moral values, the ethical values, the family values, you are divine. You are following on the path of divine politics. Okay, very good. We've got a caller on the line, uh, Brother Musa Pidcock, um, leader of the Islamic party is with us here. Musa, you're a, you're a politician, no doubt, and you've got Islamic, uh, <laughs> an Islamic party, and Molana's talking about divine politics. What's your view of the, uh, the current election? What should we, we faithful be doing in this coming election? Well, I, I, can't, say, I, I can't say what uh, I ought to say, because we're on open program, but uh, most of them are liars, that is the problem. And, uh, of course, uh, this has been the nature of British politics uh, for centuries. As uh, Benjamin Disraeli said, uh, uh, a conservative government is an organized hypocrisy. So, uh, but it is the problem of um, divine politics. Honesty needs to be returned. And unfortunately, uh, nobody is really willing to do that because they've been bought and paid for by the bankers primarily. So um, we need, but you have a problem, of course, a major problem, with particularly with the Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> when you have uh, Pope Francis uh, basically and uh, the church itself having masses on behalf of the LGBT community. Now, uh, unfortunately, the New Testament has eliminated the Ten Commandments primarily, and of course eliminates um, the, 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 the example of uh, uh, Said Namut and uh, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. But the, so there is basically no morality um, and, of course, when you've got popes and you've got the previous popes, um, and, uh, but also, if you have the example, uh, now, in the, where I have three reports now from the Vatican, that four out of five priests are homosexual. Now, how, what sort of thing does that say? 
Well, there's some interesting uh, uh, salvos there. Obviously, some complaints against the Pope. I mean, what is the position, Father Frank, on, on the Pope and the Archbishop? Archbishop Welby weighed in on the side of the chief rabbi this time, and he did actually support his, uh, his views on uh, anti-Semitism uh, within the uh, Labour Party. He didn't say anything against the Tories. But in the 2015 election, I remember that the Church of England did issue uh, a set of um, uh, adv uh, advisory notes on the election, and I'll go back to those a little bit later, but what's the official position of the Church of England or the Pope in terms of uh, their, um, their being able to promote one candidate or another to recommend that to their flock? Uh, first, I wanted to um, make um, a couple of remarks about um, what Vakula said. Uh, he said um, that the Christianity the New Testament has uh, the New Testament has eliminated the Ten Commandments. Well, if he knew anything about Christian worship, he would know that the Ten Commandments are actually part of the uh, service for Holy Communion in the Book of Common Prayer, as well as um, matins and even song, which are key service. They're there. Uh, got to be read out. So they've not been eliminated. So why aren't they being? Um, uh, our friend here has his own uh, particular obsessions, and uh, I'll let him to enjoy his own uh, obsessions. Um, I wanted to say um, something else, that uh, a moment ago we spoke about the lesser evil. Yes, but the lesser evil is still an evil. Mm. We're here to promote the higher good, yeah. the highest good. Mm. The lesser evil is not really something which we should um, relish. Uh, but now I'm coming to your question. Um, the Anglican Church uh, makes some sort of vague general statements uh, which really do not... I don't think the Anglican Church really has much to say about uh, uh, who to support, just some vague statements about Christian principles, which are so vague, they don't really amount to much. The Catholic Church is a bit more forthright on matters of abortion, for example. Um, if a candidate is supposed to be uh, pro-abortion, well, uh, Catholics are uh, uh, warned about it. But, you know, the bottom line here is uh, the authority with which I mean, there is a notion like conscience. There is a Christian conscience. A Christian conscience is informed by revelation, but also by the teachings of a church. So if these teachings are not a certain authority way, so what chance do they have to play out? Um, I mean, the present pope uh, does not really talk about abortion anymore. Previous pope, John Paul II, uh, Pope Benedict, they certainly made a big thing about abortion. And what about um, trade, Father Frank? Trade, economy. I mean, uh, Justin Welby is from a city of London. Yeah, well, you're uh, yeah, Etonian, bank, and everything else. Uh, I mean, they can make. They, the question is, there is a free market. Hmm. I don't think anybody, any Christian, can can per se, object to a free market. Mm. The question is, what kind of free market ideology we have here? It is an ideology which uh, marginalizes the oppressed and the poor, which rides roughshod over the homeless, uh, uh, the starving children, and so on. That is extreme. I mean, there was something called the Chicago School of Free Market Economics. Milton Friedman, the most notorious member of it, and very clearly not give a damn about the poor. And um, another of its more widely known exponents was the notorious Anne Rand, who really put forward wrote some novels which are basically some sort of niche and Superman kind of ideology, sort of that. Uh, you can really disregard the needs uh, of, of the poor, mm. and you, it, it's all just you know, get rich. But this is enshrined in a lot of the Tory austerity policies that we've seen over the last eight years, or perhaps uh, slightly more. Yes, I mean, free market economics is not quite as frontline as it used to be. They all pay lip service to some social policies, but in reality, they don't. I go back to a question which I like to be divine politics. I like that expression a lot because really you know, it touches 
uh, puts the finger on the issue. Are our principles ultimately derived from heaven or are they merely horizontal? Are they merely human? Uh, one of my regrets is that I hope, I was hoping that the principle of Islam, which is clearly in, in British society as now is getting more and more significant, would have contributed to shifting the argument here, to bring some of his divine principle into the arena. But I'm afraid Muslims here are so much on the defensive, these are anti-Muslim rhetoric, there's Islamophobia, mm. and some, of course, I have to say, uh, our friend again spoke of organized hypocrisy. I'm sorry to say, that some of the biggest munafikun I've come across are amongst Muslims because they like the perks of power. They love to be, you know, I was at the House of Lords once for a, an Aid and uh, Tony Blair came, came in. I remember they say Tony Blair. And there were lots of Muslim leaders, so they gathered around him like uh, bees to honey. They wanted to ingratiate themselves to a prime minister. So when you, we got that kind of uh, entrenched uh, 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 cronyism. Hypocrisy. Cronyism, yeah. I mean, uh, well, well I'll, I'll bring Musa back in on this. The whole, the whole, this, the whole, you've forgotten Vicks Pavanis. Sorry, Musa, could you repeat you've that? You've forgotten Vicks Pavanis. I mean, the whole system uh, is built on usury. And unfortunately, you mentioned Tony Blair, but uh, he was in charge of uh, planning for the 2008 crash. And if you, the whole, the, the whole system is run in favor of the banks. And we've got to, we've got to get away from that. Well, nobody has, seems to have the, the guts, certainly within the political parties that are mainstream, to really even raise that issue. It seems like the Corporation of London is exempt from any examination mm. uh, at all. And not even Jeremy Corbyn has gone yeah. down that line. If anybody was to try and go down that line, Musa, would they survive politically in this country? Well, look, uh, I can tell you now that in 2013, um, Austin Mitchell... Uh, put out an EDM, early day motion, 748, and uh, Corbyn and, uh, and MacDonald and four or five others signed it. Now, what the solution is for poverty is that the Treasury, in 1914, when the Bank, Bank of England was about to be declared bankrupt, the Treasury issued 500 million treasury notes, and this saved the Bank of England. Now, all we have to do today is expand M0 from 2.8% to, to 100%, and then you can have a billion pounds a minute for the national health because the treasury is issuing its own money, not as a debt, not as, not as a debtless interest. So all things should be sold within 24 hours now. So why has uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn reneged on that? I've got his signature on my, my copy of the document. Because obviously as there is a, a, there's a Jewish contract out on Corbyn, according to Haaretz. And Gideon Levy has now, uh, on November the 30th, published this. So there, there is, there's a contract out to silence him. And uh, that's why he's reneged. Okay, so thank you, Musa. That's a really interesting thing. We need a whole program when you come in to do that. Studio, I think we have, an, we have another uh, a video, hopefully, available. Do let me know when, when we can run our video. We've got a, a short video which actually would probably highlight the kind of concerns that Muslims have, or many minorities have, you know, post-Brexit and what's going on. And uh, looking at it from their perspective, uh, this is uh, perhaps what the picture is. Islam is also called Deen al-Fitrah, the religion of human nature, because its laws and its teachings are in full harmony with the normal and the natural inclination of the human fitrah to believe in and submit to the Creator. The human's natural state encompasses an inclination towards that which is morally and spiritually pure, upright and wholesome. The system of guidance revealed by God is the fulfillment of the natural disposition of human beings. The fitrah finds comfort in Islam as naturally as a hand fits in a glove. However, without guidance, the fitrah is corruptible. You know Allah SWT, you know your God, you know who created you, but maybe you could express differently, but inside you recognize Allah SWT and you know that He created you. The nature of man is weak. 
So there's there's some aspects who actually have no no fitra in their heart whatsoever, no aspect of deen, no aspect of a higher power whatsoever, and they believe that the human being is mighty, that the human being is the Lord. So this is where you know through man's corruption, that natural fitra becomes corrupt. But I do believe that there's there's hope for everyone. We make du'a for you know the whole of humanity at the moment. The humanity is in a really bad state, so we just make du'a for the whole of humanity that Allah Taala guides us and puts us all on the right path, the path to Jannah, inshallah. The leaders of the Brexit campaign have engendered an atmosphere where some people believe it is open season now for racism and xenophobia. Yeah. The reality is that this may have unleashed a Pandora's box of bigotry and Islamophobia that has emboldened those who have wanted to say things in the past and haven't felt that they've been able to. Whitechapel a densely populated borough in the heart of East London, home to one of the largest Muslim communities in the UK. Esmat Jeraj is an activist who has worked in the area for many years. She was one of the many Muslims to be a target of racism following Brexit. It was a Wednesday afternoon as I was walking to work from the station from down there uh, that I had a gentleman walk towards me quite purposefully um, and tell me to F off out of his country. Now, of course, I was both shocked, um, angry, and very much surprised as I hadn't faced such blatant racism in a very long time, especially in an area that was so diverse. It was very worrying that such an incident happened in the middle of the day, and with it being so close after the, the referendum on whether the UK should leave the European Union, it was clear that this was part of a much broader worrying trend around post-referendum racism and xenophobia. Unfortunately, this isn't helped by the way in which the media reports incidences. You'll rarely find a positive news stories about the Muslim community. And in fact, whenever there's something negative, faith is always brought into it if it's a Muslim. Um, now, of course, this heightens um, that, that fear. And in fact, it creates this kind of white noise that often mutes out um, some of the more logical aspects or the everyday contributions the Muslim can make and exacerbates this fear and makes people a lot more suspicious of, of their neighbor who might be Muslim. And I think you've seen this um, on a daily basis with incidences of Islamophobia, with individuals reporting Muslims who are travelling to authorities for fear that they might be joining Daesh, um, and just kind of an overall suspicion and distrust of the Muslim community, or more broadly anyone who doesn't look like them. Um, and I think both politicians and the media have a very strong role to play here in allaying some of these fears with greater religious literacy, but also greater responsible reporting and um, carefully thinking about the words that they use rather than just, just speaking blindly about a community or about a population. So there we have some uh, accounts of real experiences which obviously shape people's uh, political intentions. Islamophobia, the idea of anti-Semitism, these ideas of uh, anti-religion as well, and also other uh, notions of foreign policies. Uh, foreign policies of the British establishment, of course, have been uh, very uh, much targeting Muslim nations, but very particularly those nations that are resisting imperialism in the Middle East are getting a really, uh, you know, they're getting a very, a very raw deal indeed. So I could name Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Bahrain. The people of these countries are undoubtedly uh, under attack. Afghanistan, I forgot to mention, Libya has been turned over, m covers mostly all, all of the, the Middle East really, apart from the cronies of British imperialism or American imperialism, if you want to call it, that these guys obviously don't get a finger laid on them. The Saudis, for instance, the, the Jordanians, let's move on to the uh, Kuwaitis. Why is it that they don't get all of these hybrid wars? Why is it that they are spared uh, chaos? Why is it that you know psychological operations aren't necessarily launched upon them and they are on the other? Well, it's very simple that you've got one set of people who want independence, liberty, and freedom and the others are basically butted up through petrodollars to remain loyal to the resource rape and other economic agendas of our political elites and beyond. This is my perspective. Molana, what, what would you say in terms of this idea? We've got two callers online, so mm. maybe I'll take the questions Thanks and well. comments and then come back to yeah. you straight afterwards. Callers, uh, your, your comments, please, your, your, um, your questions. Hello, you're online, caller. Hello, Brother Mohsen. Uh, welcome, welcome, my brother. How are you, Shabir? Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Yes, very well, thank you. 
Well, as usual, an excellent program and a great debate uh, I've been following. There are just um, two points that if I could add to the discussion this evening, you may recall uh, four years ago in 2015, we launched the Muslim Manifesto at the House of Parliament. And that obviously had a lot of support from a number of MPs who turned up, plus obviously Lord Amherst, who was hosting the program. And I think the current debate about the whole moral issue and the ethics and politics is not only an interesting debate, but I think it needs to be um, continued on a regular basis, whether heightened during the election period or otherwise. Because I think um, the general public, obviously due to the immense pressure that they have uh, of uh, you know paying a mortgage, uh, paying their credit cards, uh, or students sort of um, laden with 50,000 uh, pounds uh, uh, loans, uh, they really, um, you know, perhaps um, I do not have the inclination to think about uh, the bigger picture, if you like. Sure. So it becomes incumbent on those of us who can see beyond the pixel, um, who can look at a bigger picture to inform, educate, and really uplift the thinking of the community at a wider level. And if you remember, remember I quoted something from uh, Imam Ali's letter to Malik e yes. um, who was the governor or appointed governor by Imam Ali at that time. And I think the current debate, what Labour is having of real change and sort of um, uh, for the many, not the few, is actually wonderfully encapsulated in this letter by Imam Ali 1,400 years ago. <coughs> and I'm just going to read a few lines to it. Thank you. Yes, please do. do. Please do. You must always appreciate and adopt a policy which is neither too severe nor too lenient. A policy which is based upon equity, which will be largely appreciated. Remember that the displeasure of the common men, the have-nots, and the depressed persons more overbalances than the approval of the important person, while the displeasure of the few people will be excused by the Lord if the general public and the masses of your subjects are happy with you. Now, that really, I think, is a nutshell. Beautiful. Uh, uh, sort of talks about the whole debate. Hmm. Early on, you commented what's happening in Lebanon, what's happening in Iraq, um, uh, you know, and what's happening here, and what, you know, in Bolivia, you know, the ruling elite always tends to worry about that, not just 1%, but 0.1%, while really displeasing the 99% of the public. Um, and that's where the problem arises, that the powerful, the um, influential, the people who hold the purse strings to the political parties, and not only the purse strings, but actually have the politicians at the end of the string like puppeteers. And they neglect the masses of the people. Only a few days ago, there was a report that in the UK, at this moment, we've got about 14 million working poor. This is in the fifth largest economic powerhouse. How can that happen? How is it possible that we allow this to happen? All because we are worried as uh, Imam Ali says, that big people, uh, the displeasure of the few big, weak people, big people, will be excused by the law if the general public and the masses of the subjects are happy with you. The elite, the power elite, the economic elite, the military elite, the media elite are only interested in that 1% and not the 
uh, pleasure of the masses of the people. That, I think, is a big battle. And we need to really educate. And really in line with that is the rabbit, really the rabbit uh, sort of uh, proclamation of our rabbi really shows that he's supporting the uh, 1%, not the majority of the people. That's a, a really a nice intervention. Thank you so much, Shabir. I mean, do join us more often and uh, uh, enlighten us further. But uh, I think a great intervention. This week, NATO, Donald Trump, all of the big guns, they're coming to my hometown, Watford, and they're also in London. So NATO is in my little shed. If I was in Watford, I would, would never let them across the border, but I'm not there anymore. So my Muslim brethren and other Watfordians have failed in their duty to stop these warmongers from coming and nestling in your local neighborhood. Well, they can get anywhere, can't they? But they are the 1% we should be as talking about. We've got another caller. Let's have that caller <coughs> online, and then I'll come back to my guests. Welcome, caller. Your, your comment? OK, salam alaikum. Um, I want to get the views of the uh, respected uh, priest and the Malana. Um, this election, it's uh, been interesting. We've had an intervention from the chief rabbi, which more or less has endorsed um, Johnson and his um, Tory party. So I'd like to know your views, whether uh, you think actually regarding faith and morality, where are we going with morality in this country if obviously we're endorsing candidates like... Um, Tory parties, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister? Good question. Molana, I think I've been waiting to bring you back on it. You know, what do we do about somebody as immoral as Boris, who's being put forward as a candidate? Would he even pass a Muslim uh, mor morality test for a politician? Would we even allow someone like him to, to come forward? Well, he would be immediately disqualified by the selection committee. On what basis? Uh, on basis of his character and immoral policies and support of Zionist, Zionism and all these things. Well, uh, Frank, what, would, would he pass the, the Christian morality test? Well, of course. Uh, he's uh, an imposter, a liar, and uh, a, um, in Arabic, you can, you can use the word Dajjal for a charlatan, <laughs> uh, leaving, a li leaving aside the eschatological uh, Dajjal. He's, uh, he's a Pinocchio-like figure, you know, his nose could get very long can, uh, if all the, the lies... British yeah. version of Trump. Well, I, uh, yes. Frank, let, let me come in on this now, because <laughs> Boris, I mean, I, my argument is that over this last 10 to 20 years, what we've seen is with the coming of the Brexit party and obviously the movement prior to that, you know, UKIP, etc., and the whole Brexit movement, what's happened is actually the Tories have gone further to the right. So they're where... They're much further to the right now because they had to catch up with UKIP. Uh, so many opinion makers. Uh, moderate Tories have been kicked yeah, out. Yeah, they've been kicked out. So we've quietly seen the 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 the, the right wing become more normalised, yes. more yeah. centralised. Uh, and I think this is a, a sneaky tactic that's happened. So someone like Boris or Donald Trump, etc., coming into the seats of power possibly was unthinkable maybe 20, 30 years ago. It's a reality now. Are we going to continue this slide? towards the right, because what worries me is in this election I've also picked up that what I regard as manufactured religious um, totalitarians, whether they're Zionists, whether they're Hindutva, or whether they're Takfiri types, they are lurking around the political uh, fringes, trying to influence people, and some are right at the centre. The, the Hindutva movement has a very strong uh, financial backup here, even in Britain, I would argue. The Zionists certainly have a massive financial backup here. They can use that money to influence that politics further. Of course, there's the right wing, which is also uh, probably hates all of these lot. But anyway, it's worrying that British politics is in the business now of being sort of more and more totalitarian orientated. Do you see that? Um, certainly. I mean, on the question of Boris, he's actually an opportunist. He does, he's not a man of principle. So it's actually conceivable that Boris could shift his grounds if he suited him. Um, so in that sense, uh, even Trump at some stage, maybe I'm fool enough, foolish enough, um, when he was running for president, he'd make statements about Palestine at Jerusalem, which indicated a certain flexibility. And of course, I mean, I've been proved 100% wrong. 
Uh, actually, that leads me on to a question which you raised earlier on, the question of international politics. Mm. And one of the issues which are dearest uh, to me and also, of course, to, to Muslim was Palestine, Palestinians. And there was a time when Muslim countries actually stood up, Arab countries, not just Arab countries, stood up for the rights of Palestinians. King Faisal of Saudi Arabia actually started an embargo, an oil embargo on the West to be protesting against the West's um, unfair treatment of Palestinians. Now we have a complete and total uh, fragmentation in the Arab and Muslim world. Nobody seems to care anymore. And, of course, uh, Palestinians, um, Jerusalem, Trump recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, um, moving the embassy, uh, the question of settlements, which are now uh, becoming more and more growing. Well, Jeremy more. is very good. Jeremy Corbyn is very yes. good on this. Th All this that is good. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the question is will he actually be elected? I dread to think that Boris actually will win. Um, so it's getting dark. Uh, Paki, coming back to the Chief Rabai. Now, I remember a Chief Rabai back in the 90s, uh, um, uh, Lord Jakobowicz, who was very good. He's a man, he was a man who priorit uh, prioritized moral issues. He spoke very sensibly about the AIDS scourge. Uh, he spoke about the madness of his um, uh, he animalized guys and compared uh, scientists making experiments to on animals to a whole. But of, that's changed uh, now. The new rabbi. Yeah, is now, now this, uh, this, uh, this, this new rabbi mm. has just completely. Uh, obviously, I mean, uh, he doesn't represent <laughs> me, but I think, uh, <coughs> in my opinion, he has forsaken a great deal of spiritual authority by being so one-sided, endorsing one political candidate on basis which are, uh, seem to me ex tenuous. exceedingly tenuous. Thank you very much, Father Frank. We've actually run out of time. Molana, last word from you, really, just uh, in terms of uh, what what you think, what basis people should select their, their, their party in this coming election. What are the criteria, just in two or three the, major criteria? The criteria in this election should be uh, to kick the Tories out. <laughs> well, that's uh, absolutely Shall unequivocal. <laughs> There's a fatwa from Molana. You know wh which side to vote. Obviously, he's not too concerned. I'm just worried that no matter which side wins, mm -hmm. ultimately, uh, I, I do still emphasize that I think Britain has become a plutocracy. And I think that the levers of power, including the media, the politicians, and the bankers need to be separated. There's too cozy a relationship between those institutions, for my liking, in what is a democracy and is actually actually a pseudo-democracy now, because we can vote whichever way we want. But even if, say, Jeremy Corbyn, who most Muslims certainly and most sort of the downtrodden will probably vote for, uh, even if he was to come to power, would they let him really do the things that he really wants? Would he be allowed to go all the way with the kind of social equality, the kind of uh, justice? Uh, that we all crave. But we worry about that when we come to it. When it's we come important, to it. he does come to power. I think that uh, it's it's pretty clear. You haven't got a, 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 a sort of a, you've got a unanimous vote around this table. I think there is no choice but Jeremy Corbyn on this election. Uh, what whatever happens other than that would only be, I think, a disaster for certainly those who are the poorest and the most uh, uh, work, uh, right. badly off within our society and abroad. Uh, thank you for watching. We will touch again this issue of the British elections. We didn't come on to the American one, but I'll make a special mention of that, uh, arguably uh, closer to the time when they're going to be holding their elections. But uh, thank you for watching this edition of Critical Eye.